It is now time for question period. The member from Whitby, Ottawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, it's Budget Day, and over the course of the next week or so, the NDP is going to have to decide whether to support your government or allow Ontarians to judge your ability to govern. But Stop the uh, I am. Uh, well, I was almost ready to admonish the other side, and I'm going to let everyone know that I will keep control today. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell come to order. The Attorney General come to order. The member from Oxford come to order. And the member from Leeds Grenville come to order. Please put your question. Thank you, Mr. Nothing. Speaker. But, Premier, we know that nothing has changed. Time and time again, your government has shown that you're more concerned about your own interests than the interests of the province of Ontario. You've continued a pattern of spending that's intended to help no one but the Liberal Party. Consider it. E-health, a billion dollars. Orange, $300 million. Cancel gas plants, $600 million. Premier, do you think a government that's blown some $2 billion has earned the ability to govern the province? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today is Budget Day, Mr. Speaker, and I really believe that the people of Ontario would expect that every member of this legislature would read the budget before they decide whether they're going to support it or not, Mr. Speaker, because this budget, the budget today will about, be about creating jobs, Mr. Speaker. It will be about making changes to help people in their everyday lives. So I would ask the member opposite if she is going to read the budget, if she is going to look at the details, then we're going to talk about youth employment, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, about reducing auto insurance, about investing in roads and bridges, Mr. Speaker. Those are those are the issues that affect people's everyday lives, and I hope that the member opposite will read it and then make her Thank determination. Well, Mr. Speaker, I certainly do intend to read the budget, but most of it's already been leaked anyway. So, the, and the pattern is clear. Again and again, when faced with a decision to spend money for Liberals or spend money for Ontarians, the Liberals give priority to, guess what, the Liberal Party. Just yesterday, while Amanda Telford, an Ottawa mother, made the painful decision to leave her autistic son in a government building, the Liberal government was busy announcing Guess what? A $45 million subsidy for music producers. That's true. At every turn, Mr. Speaker, this government chooses what it thinks is best for them. Premier, do you think a government that prioritizes a $45 million subsidy over basic critical services to families ne desperately needing their help has earned the right to govern? Here, here. Here. Premier. What I, Mr. Speaker, I am very aware of the media reports on this case, and I. The member from from Dufferin Caledon. Oh, I had to locate you. Please. Very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very aware of the media reports on this case, and I can't I can't comment on a specific case, Mr. Speaker. But I I recognize that caring for an adult family with a, a developmental disability can be challenging, Mr. Speaker. And we will actually speak to that in our budget. And if the member opposite reads the budget, she will see that. But from my perspective, Mr. Speaker, these are not mutually exclusive issues. We absolutely have to work to make the lives of the parents who are working, who are living with children with uh, developmental disabilities, we have to work to make their lives better. But, Mr. Speaker, that doesn't mean that we can turn our back on investing in an economy that will create jobs, and the music industry is part of that economy, Mr. Thank Speaker. Ultimately, this is a question about priorities. Mr. Rural Affairs, come to order. The decision to spend some $600 million to save a few Liberal seats. Yet there are thousands of Ontarians out there, like Amanda Telford, like Wilma Arthurs, who are unable to have even the basic supports they need in order to care for their disabled children. Minister of Energy, come to order. Do you think a government that prioritizes saving their own seats over serving the needs of Ontarians at a very basic level deserves the right to govern? Thank you, Mr. Premier. You see it, please? Premier, Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Second and time, I, member from Halton. I have said repeatedly, in answer to questions at committee, in this legislature that I regret that we have been in this situation around the relocation of the gas plants, Mr. Speaker. We implemented a decision, implemented a decision that had been made by every member in this House. All parties had decided that this is what they wanted to do, Mr. Speaker, and because we all had listened to the members of the community and we determined that the gas plants needed to be re relocated, Mr. Speaker. But to suggest that somehow, because because that happened, because it was an implementation of a decision that we all had made that somehow we can't then talk about the need to create jobs and make sure that we help people in their everyday lives, Mr. Speaker, is ludicrous. That is what yes, the budget is about. That is what moving forward is about, Mr. Speaker. I regret that that happened. It shouldn't have happened, and we have to make sure it doesn't happen again. But we also have to work together to improve people's lives and make sure that we create yes. jobs in this province. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. While the uh, while the clock is stopped, I believe there's a budget this afternoon, and I'm absolutely convinced each and every one of you want to be there. And if there's going to be a test of my will to bring decorum. I'll pass the test. So, uh, new question, the member from Nepean Carlton. Speaker, my question is also to the Premier, but may I say this first and foremost? This side of the House is appalled that you did what you just did in applauding that Premier after what happened in Ottawa to that family and the, the disabled side. Now, now, to the heart of my matter, Speaker. To the Premier, during your testimony in Justice Committee Tuesday, did you refuse to admit you knew the true cost of the Oakville power plant cancellation exceeded $40 million from the outset because you were under oath? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I answered my questions on the gas plant relocations in committee, Mr. Speaker, and I just want to be clear. I am not going to, and our government is not going to concede the ground on compassion to the people across the floor, Mr. Speaker. That is the party that cut welfare rates, Mr. Speaker. We created, we created the passport program, Mr. Speaker. We have invested in autism, Mr. Speaker, to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. You want to slash tax? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, come to order. The uh, member from Kent Lambton, Kent Middlesex, come to order. The member from Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington, come to order. The, the Minister of Social Services, come to order. Oh, I want you to come to order anyway. Thank you. Premier. The leader of that party has said, Mr. Speaker, that what they want to do is cut revenue, cut taxes that means cutting services he's also said that he he believes that everything he did when he was a cabinet minister in mike harris's cabinet was exactly what should have happened mr speaker we've seen that movie and we're not going there you see it, please you see it, please you see it, please Perhaps the Premier is so angry because she did cede compassion to this party when her party decided to prioritize Liberal seats over the people of Ottawa. Now, Premier, Shelley Jameson, 
Joanne Butler, David Lindsay, David Livingston, and Colin Anderson all testified that your Liberal government was aware of the true cost of the Oakville power plant was over $40 million from the outset. David Anderson said everybody from natural resources come to order. said it was buckets of costs. In committee, you refused to admit what you knew and when you knew it, even though you were the campaign chair who made the decision and you were a cabinet minister who met about it. So I want to know, why did she intentionally use the $40 Thank million you. figure when she Thank knew you. it was false? Premier, you it, please. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I've answered my questions on the gas plant relocation in committee, Mr. Speaker. So let me talk about let me talk about some things that I think the party opposite, given their given their uh, their position on uh, fiscal responsibility, some things that they should be interested in, Mr. Speaker, and some reasons they should read the budget. Our deficit projection, Mr. Speaker, is now down to 9.8 billion dollars, a reduction of five billion from last year, Mr. Speaker. This is the fourth year in a row that Ontario has achieved a lower deficit forecast. We're going to continue to build on our successes, Mr. Speaker. This budget is going to be about creating. I'm, I'm I'm going to pass phase one of the test. The member from uh, Lambton, Kent, Middlesex is warned. And anyone else that wants to wow will be warned too. I'm going to show you my resolve. You, you want the test? I'll pass it. Carry on. It's going to be about creating jobs and working to improve people's everyday lives, Mr. Speaker. We're moving ahead on 60 percent of the Drummond Report recommendations, which is something that has been coming across the floor at us, Mr. Speaker. We are making Remember changes. Rainford, we are transforming order. government. We are going to be yes, creating sir. jobs and making people's lives better. I think the party officers should read the budget and then decide how they're going to vote on it. That was cute. Speaker, we did read the budget. It's been 10 long years of Liberal rule that has cost us jobs, that has cost us our health care system, that is costing us our prosperity, that cost us our have status in this province. But let's get back to the politically motivated decision to save Liberal seats in the last election, the one where she knew it was going to cost well over $40 million from the outset. That strikes at the very heart of our democratic principles in this province. But you know what else strikes at the heart of our democratic principles? Principles by refusing to call a confidence motion that this party has tabled. It is clear, having spoken to the public in the last week, and Tim Hudak will allude to this later today, that your government has lost confidence in the, the people. And they have lost confidence question. in you. My question for the Premier, if she can listen for two seconds, is this. Will you call our confidence motion for debate? Will you call it for Thank a vote? You. Or will you simply table Thank your you. budget and call it for Premier? Speaker, I have extreme faith in the people of Ontario, and I believe that they deserve, they deserve a government that is focusing on their needs and understands that their, their everyday lives have been tough in the last few years, Mr. Speaker, and that they're worried about Tomorrow's whether they're going to get home care for their loved ones, Mr. Speaker. They're worried about whether their children, their adult children, are going to get a job, Mr. Speaker. They're worried about whether their small town is going to be able to flourish because the roads and bridges need to be made, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And they talk to their town councillors, and their town councillors say, well, we've talked to the government, and we need a roads and bridges fund because we need this small town to have that support. We're providing that, Mr. Speaker. That's what we're putting in our budget. Those are the issues that we're going to be focusing on, Mr. Speaker. And I really hope that the member opposite takes the time to look at the budget, takes the time to Answer. see what's there and think about what her constituents are talking to her about in terms of their everyday lives, and that she'll then consider whether she's going to support the budget or not, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Your question. The member from Beaches, East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In today's tough economic times, people are worried about falling further and further behind. They're worried about their kids finding a good job, about their loved ones accessing home care, and about household bills like auto insurance rising higher and higher. And they're frustrated to see a government more concerned with their political fortunes than the challenges facing the province. Will the Premier listen to Ontarians' concerns, and will the budget today finally put people's priorities ahead of Liberal priorities? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I have said consistently that what 
this budget is about. And really, Mr. Speaker, what our what our philosophy in this uh, in this government is about is about listening to people in the province, listening to people in communities, and responding to them in a way that demonstrates that we do understand their concerns and the issues that. The uh, member opposite has identified are ones that have been identified by his party, and they are ones that we were already working on, Mr. Speaker, whether it's home care or whether it is finding jobs and finding opportunities for young people to get an experience that would lead to a job. So, uh, you know, making sure that they have a co op placement or an internship so that they Answer. can get a foot in the door, Mr. Speaker, those are the kinds of issues that we need to focus on, and that's what you will see in our budget, Thank you. Mr. Speaker. At the same time the Premier has been making all these grandiose things, she also claims that the government needs to be careful with the public's dollars, and we know that's true, but, but you haven't been. Yet she seems fine with suggesting people should pay more, even though household budgets in many cases are strained. Does the Premier think it's fair that a government spending billions on higher CEO, CEO salaries, corporate tax loopholes and cancelled gas plant deals is in reality asking people to pay more? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So let me let me just take these issues uh, one at a time because he's talking. Uh, the member opposite is talking about um, making changes that would uh, would require that we make an investment, Mr. Speaker. And I think what he's not saying is that that. That issue is investment in trends, Durham, Mr. Speaker, and making sure that we have the revenue streams that allow people to pick up their child and from childcare in a timely way and get home, get to work in the morning in time, get get to uh, get to Member school with uh, Creek, with their child the in the morning, Mr. Speaker. That's what building transit is about, and making sure that Member we have a revenue Tim stream Bay, to build transit is order. extremely important to us, and I believe it's important to the constituents in the uh, the members' riding. In fact, and across the uh, across the GTHA, yes, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the relocation of the gas plants, I have said that we cannot let that situation happen again. We all agree Thank that you. the relocations needed to happen. Thank you. Final supplementary. If the Premier thinks transit is so important, then release the Metrolink's report you're sitting on. Let us all see it. Ontarians want to see a balanced uh, approach to balancing the books in today's budget. New Democrats have been clear. In these tough economic times, we shouldn't be making it even tougher for families to ask them to pay more. Ontarians want to see a government who understands their challenges, but that's not what we've been seeing in Ontario today. Is the Premier ready to admit that her government needs to get her priorities in check, actually listen to Ontarians, and put forward a budget with real results to the challenge facing the province and the people who live here? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Actually, the Metrolinks report is I have not seen the Metrolinks report, so I'm not sure what the member opposite is talking about. Mr. Speaker, our budget is going to be about creating jobs and making sure that we make improvements that will help people in their everyday lives. That is what the Minister of Finance has been doing for the last number of weeks. He's been traveling the province. He's been listening to people's concerns. That's what our jobs roundtables were about, Mr. Speaker. So whether it's providing home care and making sure that people have home care in a timely way, or whether it's about helping people, young people, to find their way into the workforce, Mr. Speaker, because there is a mismatch between the jobs that are available and the skills that, that young people have. And we need to make that actually was a, an idea yes, that sir. has come out of conversations with people across the province, Mr. Speaker. So that's what you will see in our budget. And I look forward to the debate and I look forward to support from across the floor, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. When the government cancelled the Mississauga and Oakville gas plants, they wrote blank checks to private power producers. Over and over, the Liberals chose to keep the public in the dark, keeping them in the dark rather than come clean about the costs, which turned out to be eight times higher than the Liberals were willing to admit. You'd think the government would have learned its lesson that the public doesn't like secret power deals. Will the government commit to ending secret power deals that leave Ontarians paying more? Very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I've answered many of these questions in the committee, and I have said clearly, Mr. Speaker, that the way this process unfolded was unacceptable. We cannot let this happen again. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, that 
Everyone in this House agreed that these power plants should be relocated. We implemented that, uh, that decision, Mr. Speaker, and we have to make sure that the process is changed for the next time round. But, Mr. Speaker, that does not that discussion does not preclude the importance of bringing a budget forward that speaks to creating jobs and making sure that we make changes that help people in their everyday lives. It is imperative that we do that, Mr. Speaker. That's what our budget has, is going to focus on, and I look forward to, to the debate in the Thank House. You, supplementary. Well, Speaker, to the Premier, the government doesn't have an estimate for the cost of refurbishing Darlington. Yet nearly a billion dollars worth of contracts have already been signed. It's entirely possible that the cost of refurbishing Darlington will prove to be impractical or too expensive for Ontario. Will Ontarians be left on the hook again like they were with the Mississauga and Oakville secret power deals? Premier. Of energy. The Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the member will know that we have a long-term energy plan. In that long-term energy plan, it uh, requires 47% uh, of our uh, generation to come from nuclear generation. We have announced that we're going to be... I uh, know that the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek would want to sit in his seat so I could tell him to stop. Thank you. Speaker, that we're doing a review of the long-term energy plan. Uh, that will include uh, looking at refurbishment and looking at new nuclear, and we will be listening to the opposition, meeting with the opposition critics. We will be consulting across the province, Mr. Speaker. We have been extremely successful in our long-term energy plan to date. We've created over 11,000 megawatts of new generation at a time when we had blackouts and brownouts from the previous government. Mr. Thank you. Final supplementary. Premier, you don't seem to want to answer the question. When it comes to the government's plans for the refurbishment at Darlington, it's like you're driving by looking in the rearview mirror. Ontarians need to know the cost before you spend the money, not when they get the bill. Not when they get the bill. Why doesn't the government care about spending public money wisely? Mr. Speaker. The issue of Darlington uh, refurbishment and the possibility of new nuclear uh, has been under discussion publicly. Uh, the Ontario Power Generation has been uh, doing uh, all kinds of research on that issue, Mr. Speaker. We are dealing with it extremely responsibly. The important issue here is we have to make a determination whether nuclear as our base load is going to continue, as many people recommend, Mr. Speaker, or not. We're going to have a review process, Mr. Speaker, and I would expect that the member will not get so worked up that he won't have any energy left to help us in our consultations. Thank you. Your question, the member from New York City. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday in the Legislature, you said, and I quote, we must have a better process going forward. I hope the Justice Committee, having heard all of the witnesses, is going to be able to help and give some advice on how, going forward, we can avoid this situation ever happening again, end of quote. Premier, we have 17 gas plants in Ontario, and there have been no problems with those existing ones. Why would you suggest that this fiasco might happen again? Is it because you foresee your government needing to make a quick seat-saver decision oh. again in the next election? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Actually, Actually, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you, thank you for noting that 17 of the 19 Minister gas Minister. plants that have been located were located in a, in a very good way, Mr. Speaker. Um, no, I was actually making the point, Mr. Speaker, that when there is a reversal of a decision. So, for example, Mr. Speaker, when there was a hole dug on Eglinton Avenue for the subway, the Eglinton subway, 
and then the decision was made not to do that and $100 million was spent, Mr. Speaker. What I'm saying is that when decisions like that are made, and I know that the member opposite was part of the party that, needed, that made that decision, Mr. Speaker, when decisions like that are made, I want to make sure that we have a process that is transparent, that's open, so that when we all determine, as we did in the uh, relocation of the gas plants, that it needs to happen, that the process is as open as Answer. possible, Mr. Speaker. The member from Bruce Gray Owen South. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Premier, despite your denials, you've been intimately involved in the gas plant scandal from day one. Here is what we know. You were a Liberal campaign vice chair. You were a senior cabinet minister. You were chair of cabinet. And now, of course, Liberal Party leader and Premier. Premier, you have said publicly that the Oakville gas plant would be $40 million, a low ball by 775 per cent. What we don't know is why you keep claiming ignorance after Colin Anderson exposed you by telling us under oath that everyone in the government knew the cost exceeded $40 million. Please take responsibility. Please tell the truth. Premier, when were you told the costs were higher, and why did you continue to use a number that you knew was wrong? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I have answered this question many times. I regret the situation. I take responsibility for making sure we have as open a process as possible, and we need to make sure this doesn't happen again, Mr. Speaker. However, this is not going to stop us from bringing in a budget that is going to create jobs and that is going to work to improve people's everyday lives. Let me talk, Mr. Speaker, just about the announcements that we've made so far, Mr. Speaker. We have said that we want to invest in home care to reduce the time that it takes for people to get home care, Mr. Speaker, and we're going, we're going to invest $260 million for home and community care. And what that means is that's an extension of the health care, Mr. Speaker, that people receive at home. We are going to invest in a $100 million Answer. fund, Mr. Speaker, so that small and rural municipalities will have access to infrastructure funding, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. That's what's Thank going you. to be the Your question, the member from Kitchener-Waterloo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister Sir, the of Environment, Municipal that's Affairs about and it. Housing. The OMB recently overruled the region of Waterloo's official plan and supported sprawl development on 1,000 hectares of rural land. This ruling hurts local agricultural businesses and jobs, increases municipal infrastructure costs, and undermines transit-oriented development. This is far from the first time an OMB decision has gone against progressive planning principles and good local economies. When will the minister finally admit that the unelected, outdated OMB is not serving the needs of Ontarians and take action to reform this unelected body? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Um, well, Speaker, I guess I'll speak to the first part of the question. There were kind of two parts to that question, and certainly when the uh, Ontario Municipal Board uh, issued its decision with regards to the region of Waterloo's uh, official plan and regarding the development of the area in uh, regarding their growth plan, certainly uh, they had contacted my ministry and asked for our assistance. And uh, they, the City of Waterloo obviously sought appeal to uh, this decision through the Divisional Court. Um, and certainly we, con that we were contacted and we uh, went back, dis discussed the decision. And certainly we shared our intent, we've made it public, that we will uh, act as a party to the Waterloo's decision because uh, certainly we think that that's important to do. Bef because the issue is before the courts, obviously I it would be inappropriate for me to comment any further, but I can comment to the importance of a growth plan. Certainly I think everybody in this legislature yes, understands sir. that it's important to have a vision that guides all of the province and uh, the Golden Horseshoe over the next 25 years, and we're working with municipalities to make Thank that you. happen. Thank you, Speaker. Two supplementary. Minister, I've heard repeatedly from constituents who feel the OMB does not speak for them and that community members and municipal leaders should have more input into planning decisions. The OMB decision in Waterloo re reveals systemic problems with the planning process, ambiguities about density targets in the Places to Grow Act, lack of consideration of local and environmental impacts, and a lack of municipal authority over official plans. When will the government fix the planning process so that it serves families and communities rather than the interests of those who hold power at the OMB. Minister. So I understand that many of my colleagues have an interest in improving the OMB, and certainly my colleagues from across the aisle have made suggestions on how we can improve it. Both parties have made suggestions, and we welcome their input on how to improve the process. 
Uh, we listened to our municipal partners uh, back in 2006 when we added the requirement that the OMB uh, take into consideration the information that is provi provided by municipal councils in making their decision. Uh, in addition, we also uh, made sure that uh, municipalities had the ability to create their own local appeals body uh, with regards to certain planning matters, showing our, go our government's respect for elected officials and their decision making. Our government is always open to and receptive to uh, hearing new and constructive ideas on how to improve this system. Certainly, it's a conversation that I've been having Answer. with the AMO board it, at, at our MOU table because we respect and want to consult with municipalities across Ontario how to make the system Thank more you. constructive. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Mississauga Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. And, Speaker, as you probably noticed by now, uh, public transit is a passion of mine. It it's a very is. important file for me, not just because of the reflection of my value systems, but the reality of living in a fast-growing suburb. The reality, Speaker, is that Mississauga, as Ontario's third largest city, not just deserves but needs more public transit. And I'm really proud to be part of an administration that has invested so much in Miss Saga, whether it's more go parking spots, whether it's more go double decker trains, or whether it's two more trains on the Milton line. But we still need more. And I know that the big move has big plans for Mississauga. So, Minister, I was interested to read in the Globe and Mail that there was some talk about reconsidering some of the projects on the big, big move. Could you speak? Could you, Minister, please Thank set you. the record straight on this article? Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Mississauga's Cooksville who has raised these issues consistently in the House. The big move contains 15 projects that are described. The first wave projects right now, Mr. Speaker, are under construction. We're very excited to see boring machines on Eglinton and across the GTHA. We are now moving with the balance of second wave projects, Mr. Speaker, which we are also very clearly committed to and to seeing fulfilled. We look forward to working with Metrolinx and to our municipal partners and regional partners to fully realize and optimize, optimize those, those projects. Mr. Speaker, our investment strategy that is now being developed by Metrolinx will, will, will make sure that this is not just a dream, but it, they are fully realized because, Mr. Speaker, we have to make sure we have the financial capacity to solve Answer. the congestion problem get people home to their, to their families on time and move these projects forward, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. It's really reassuring to know that we are still committed to the big move. And I really want to thank you once again for, many of, for some of the big investments that have been made in Mississauga, uh, especially on the GO file, whether it's uh, two more trains on the GO line, more parking, double-decker buses. However, Minister, the article specifically mentioned the BRT, the Bus Rapid Transit, as one of those projects that might be reconsidered. Now, the BRT is already under construction in Mississauga, and I know that my constituents are looking forward to its completion. Could you specifically speak to this project, Minister? Good. 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 Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Not, not only Mr. Speaker, is the BRT project a critical priority? We have already put $65 million as a province into the project, and the city of Mississauga, as you know, is, con is uh, contributing another $48 million, Mr. Speaker, for an 18-kilometer two-way uh, BRT system. We are also moving forward, Mr. Speaker, in the second phase with projects like the Here Ontario LRT, the Eglinton Crosstown Line, Mr. Speaker. These are municipal priorities, and Metro Links and connecting to our Places to Grow plan and the big move looks at the regional perspective on this and how we how we connect these projects going forward, Mr. Speaker. Our plan for the big move is more than simply Answer. a handful of projects or uh, or a number of projects, Mr. Speaker. It is a plan a meant to increase mobility. And, uh, and reduce congestion, and we will optimize each project to that outcome, Mr. Duke. Speaker. Question the member from Lincoln, Kent Middlesex. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier uh, Mitchell's Bay, a small town in my riding, experienced flooding in January, which resulted in the, in the loss of power to 45 homes and cottages. Sadly, they are still without power and may not have power restored until later this month, nearly five months later. Ironically, these 45 homes still continue to receive hydro bills, oh which include God. charges for delivery, 
debt retirement, and global adjustment. Premier, is your government so desperate to pay for your political decision to cancel the Mississauga and Oakville power plants that you have to continue to bill my constituents when they are not even receiving the service that you, Premier, are billing them for? Premier. Mr. Speaker, what we're talking about here is the reliability of the electricity system across the province. When we took over government, we had blackouts, we had brownouts, we had dirty coal burning generation, Mr. Speaker, and it was totally unreliable. We have since built, invested in over 11,000 megawatts of new generation of power. We've almost totally eliminated dirty burn coal, uh, coal burning generation. They love coal. They love coal. We have invested. While I'm uh, prepared to talk to some people on this side, I'm now going to have to talk to people on this side. I, I wish I could figure this one out. And you can point to the clock all you want. Thank you. Invested over $9 billion in new or expanded transmission services across the province. On the particular issue that he's raised, I'll be more than happy to get the information and look into it and get back to you before the end of today. Supplementary. Uh, uh, back to the Premier. Premier, this is simply not right. If your government cannot deliver an essential service such as heating a home in the middle of the winter time, then the least you can do is stop sending the bill. It is unacceptable that you are taking the people of Ontario to the cleaners to pay for the cost of your gas plant scandal. Premier, no doubt I don't need to tell you that the people of Mitchells Bay have lost all confidence in your Liberal government. Premier, can you explain to this House why the people, why the people of Mitchells Bay have to pay for the handful of Liberal seats that you saved by moving the Mississauga and Oakville gas plants, and how this House can have any confidence in your Liberal government whatsoever? Mr. Speaker, our system of LDCs, local distribution companies, including Hydro One, are among the best in North America, Mr. Speaker. We have invested, as I mentioned, in transmission services in order to provide better service, $9 billion over that period of time. We invested in a system that has The member from Chatham, Kent Essex, is now warned. Phase two. We, had a, we invested in a system that had deteriorated beyond acceptable levels. The system was not reliable in member any from way, shape, or form, Mr. Speaker. Come to order. And as I mentioned to the member, I'd be more than happy to receive the details and look into that issue for you and get back to you before the end of today. Thank you. Your question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Environment. Speaker, there's a proposal to build an ethanol plant in Oshawa Harbour. Many people in Oshawa and across Ontario oppose this proposed plant because it's next to a provincially significant second marsh wetland, and it will cause significant air pollution and truck traffic, and it's not consistent with the city's vision of a clean, people-friendly waterfront. Speaker, why has the minister been so silent on this issue of concern to so many Oshawa residents? Minister of the Environment. I, I can't recall being accused of being silent at any time. <laughs> in this house or elsewhere. Well, <laughs> the member says, uh, uh, shall I repeat that? Uh, you go ahead, because I was going to myself. Oh, okay. uh, I want to say I have actually met with the Mayor of Oshawa on this very issue and have had communications with him. As you know, this is, on, uh, uh, this is under federal jurisdiction, and I know that there are a number of people who have made representations to the federal government on this, and no doubt to the local federal members who are uh, present on that occasion. But I do want to say that I have been in communication with and had a, a very good meeting with the Mayor of Oshawa and uh, have uh, conveyed to the federal government the concerns that Oshawa has had Sir. in this regard, and I will continue to do so, even though it's under federal jurisdiction. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the proposed ethanol plant 
may be on federal land, but it has a clear provincial component. Communications from the Ministry of the Environment indicate that provincial laws apply to this project and that provincial permits are needed for water taking during construction and to control noise, air emissions and sewage and wastewater emissions during plant operation. Speaker, when will the minister finally stand up for Oshawa Harbour and make it clear that provincial approvals will not be granted and construction of the plant will not be allowed to proceed unless environmental concerns are addressed? I want to say that that's precisely what I've done in my discussions uh, uh, with the mayor of Oshawa. I, I know that uh, you have probably asked your federal uh, leader, Mr. Mulcair, to raise this issue in the House of Commons <laughs> because, it comes, because it comes under federal jurisdiction. They may have been preoccupied with other issues there. I understand that fully. But I would certainly suggest that a matter under federal jurisdiction should be raised, in fact, in the House of Commons of Canada. Having said that, uh, I have made known to the federal government uh, the views of the Mayor of Oshawa and those who have concerns about the proposal that is there. And uh, I think the people in that area who have met with me are fully aware of the stand that I have taken in this regard. And, sir, we want to ensure that. All necessary protections are uh, available to the people of that area, and I will ensure from a provincial point of view Thank you. that is well known. Thank you. New question, the member from Glengarry, Foxcott, Russell. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the ever-energetic Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. This government is strongly committed to providing access to our world-renowned colleges and universities, and our recent announcement of the reduced tuition framework has been well received by students and families right across the province of Ontario and in my riding of Glengarry, Prescott and Russell. Post-secondary education is crucial to our economic future, and many students in high school are faced with tough decisions upon graduation. Students at the end of their high school careers must decide whether to attend college and or university. Some students worry that if they attend a college but later decide to attend a university, transferring credits can be difficult. I've also heard, Mr. Speaker, that students face transfer credit challenges even when they move within the university Question. system. Mr. Speaker, through you to the hardworking minister, what are we doing to assist those students? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. To the visionary uh, member from Glengarry Prescott Russell, uh, he does raise a very important issue, all kidding aside. Many students choose to move from one program to another during their academic career. And Mr. Speaker, we have to make sure that they can do just that. I've recently met with the university and college presidents, and this important topic of credit transfer came up. I think it's really important to point out that a great deal of progress has already been made on credit transfer. The, the ministry announced a, pr a provincial credit transfer initiative worth uh, $73.7 million in funding over five years. We launched a bilingual credit transfer website in 2011 to improve transparency and access to information, and we established the Council, uh, Ontario Council on Articulation, with the, which is fostering uh, these credit transfers. Mr. Speaker, there's more work to be done. I'm looking forward to working with all stakeholders to deliver even more progress when it comes Thank you. to credit transfers. Um, not to be a killjoy, but uh, I want to be consistent when I'm in this chair. I am going to ask all members, uh, because I have admonished someone in the past on the opposition side for using any kind of adjective in front of the minister's uh, portfolio or the riding, I'm going to ask that that stop as well. Uh, it is not balanced and it's not helpful. So I'm going to ask everyone to please simply make mention of their riding or the minister's title. That's it. Just, it's not helpful. Please. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that very comprehensive answer. Absolutely. It is good to know that the steps taken to make movement within the post-secondary system easier. I urge the Minister to push for more progress on trans uh, credit transfer opportunities on behalf of students right across this province. The economy is changing fast, Mr. Speaker, and students sometimes need to change their paths to adjust to those opportunities at the same time. Mr. Speaker, while university may be the best post-secondary route for some, the college road is becoming a first choice for many students as well. 
So I would ask the minister if he can confirm that Ontario students are wise to consider career co colleges as an alternative for first choice for post-secondary education. Minister. Mr. Speaker, this is, a, this is a very important question, and it's a very difficult decision for students to make as they, as they graduate from high school. Do they go the college route or the university route? And I think the good news is here in Ontario, that is a choice that students have to make, but either route, they're going to be getting a world-class education here in the province of Ontario, and that's good for all of our students. In fact, in a recent survey of college graduates in 2011-2012, over 83 per cent were employed within six months of graduation. Mr. Speaker, that shows good progress. I think there's more work to be done. Our world-class college system is demonstrating that the significant investments that we've been making in our colleges, Mr. Speaker, are paying off. Evidence of that fact is that 93 per cent of employers who hired a recent college grad we're satisfied, very satisfied with their hire. Answer. That tells us, Mr. Speaker, the investments we're making in our college system are paying off. It's an excellent first Thank choice for, for students across. New question. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Consumer Services. Minister, as of May 1st, Ontarians who go to purchase a big screen TV will be forced to pay 40% higher eco tax thanks to your government. The Environment Minister signed off on this massive eco-tax increase without giving any forewarning to consumers. He knew full well that this decision would be extremely unpopular, so he hid it from the public and still, to this date, refuses to admit he rubber-stamped this massive Sweep increase, under the even though I have his approval letter right here. No. We know from the Premier's testimony at the Gas Plant Committee she All currently right. doesn't read documents she signs that link her to scandals and mismanagement. So can you tell this House if the Environment Minister at least ran it by you? Minister of, Minister of the Environment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I've been discussing with a number of people the very inadequate Conservative bill, which was the Ontario Waste Diversion Act, and all of the Shameful. problems uh, that it has created for this province. And each one of the groups I talked to uh, is is very concerned about hearing what the Conservatives are saying in this particular matter, because they mischaracterize on many occasions what these are all about. Uh, that's a withdrawal. I will withdraw. Yeah. Boy, when I, I want to see, I've listened to many of the statements that have been made by members of the opposition. I'm going to tell you that come a lot closer to unparliamentary than I, when I just went through. But I want to, I want to say that the information, the information that the, that the member is trying to convey to this house, of course, is incorrect. He knows the Ontario government receives no money from this. He knows it is as a result of the legislation that his government put into effect. Legislation we are going to change completely, revise completely and make sure that this kind of situation does not arise in the years Thank to you. come. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, for, my record, uh, for the record, my question was actually to the Minister of Consumer uh, Services. You know, asking the Environment Minister about consumer protection would be like asking a bandit for a lesson in fair pricing. <laughs> Min Minister, as the person charged with protecting consumers, I'm sure you can understand why Ontarians are shocked that you failed to address this issue. Instead of standing up for consumers, you sat on the sidelines while the Minister of the Environment and Ontario Electronic Stewardship quietly plotted a massive new eco-tax hike they both hoped would just fly under the radar. This behaviour couldn't be more unaccountable, lack more transparency and be more anti-consumer. Minister, how can Ontario consumers have confidence in your government when you can't even protect them from your own environment minister? Thank you. You see that, please? You see that, please? I'm worried. I'm worried. First of all that the very good veterans that are members of the Conservative caucus never seem to get a chance yeah, to ask any right. questions anymore. <laughs> we have introduced as a government two bills 
that are designed to help consumers in this province. The Progressive Conservative Party and caucus are stalling both of those bills, will not let them go to committee. But speaking of consumer ministers, the person who had a chance back when you passed that ill-advised legislation in 2002, your leader of your party, was the Minister of Consumer and Commercial Relations. He, in effect, is the, he is the godfather of equal fees in this province. What did Bill Murdoch say about him? And I remember the quotation of one Bill Murdoch, right. a former member what of this legislature, on the job that the leader was doing at that time. Worst minister. I hope that this member will support the legislation we'll be bringing forward to replace the ill-conceived, inappropriate legislation that was brought Thank forward you. by your government. Mr. Preston, the member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. By your own admission, our jail system is currently operating at 95 per cent capacity, and those numbers are only forecast to increase. Yet your ministry is closing down a perfectly functional jail in Sarnia without any consideration for the safety of inmates and corrections officers. As we've seen at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre, crowded and unsafe conditions lead to fights and lockdowns, which endanger the lives of inmates and staff. Will the Liberal government create an actual plan to ensure the safety of inmates and correctional officers instead of closing down jails without the numbers to back up those closures. The Minister of Community Safety and Corrections. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is a very good question. Yes, we are uh, having uh, um, an issue with uh, overcrowding in our jail, and we are addressing it. So we will be opening two new jails pretty soon, and uh, we need to modernize our system. And that's why I asked my staff to prepare a, a plan for renewal of our infrastructure. We are presently uh, occupying an uh, jails that were built prior to Confederation. So we are closing them, we are modernizing our system, and uh, as you know, because of a bill that was passed by uh, the uh, federal government, now we have more inmates coming into our system. So we are getting ready for that, and we will continue to modernize our jail system. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mr. Speaker. The Speaker, the Minister makes a compelling case for continuing to keep the Sarnia jail open. Obviously, you've said that we have more inmates coming into the system due to the federal changes at the federal level. Minister, a tool within the direct supervision model is space to properly house those who cannot cope appropriately within the jail. The Sarnia jail closure will mean less space for such inmates. No space, especially on weekends, which will lead to transfers to Toronto of inmates serving their jail sentences. The closure will lead to increased costs, hardship for correctional officers and inmates, and is just an overall bad plan. Will the minister commit today to putting the safety of workers and inmates first? Yes, sir. Speaker, yes, I am commit, uh, committed to that, yes. and that's why you know I asked my staff to uh, give me a plan to modernize the system. But I'll say to the member on the other side that you should ask, you should ask your brother and sister at you the federal the question, level to, to the address this situation and ask for the help of the federal government to give us more money so that we can help, you know, to put in place a new and very uh, modernized uh, jail system. And I noticed, Mr. Speaker, that in the uh, coming from the uh, from the auditor, federal auditor general, you know, he's talking about uh, 11 billion dollar uh, of uh, uncollected taxes. So if they do, then the federal government will be able to continue the, to transfer yeah. money to the That's province right. to help us, you know, to put uh, forward their uh, C, uh, Bill C-10, who has, you know, the negative in, uh, effect of having more inmates in our. Thank you. New question. The member from Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, uh, Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Labour. Minister, with summer on the way, young people in Lisgar, Meadowvale and Streetsville are busy filling out applications to places like local golf courses, summer camps, retailers and other employers. While new and young workers bring a new energy to the workplace, 
They may not always recognize workplace health and safety hazards on their first summer job or their current summer job. In fact, new and young workers are four times more likely to be injured within the first month of their job than at any other time. Minister, what role can youth, parents and employers in Mississauga play to make sure our Ontario workplaces are as safe as possible? Good thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank the, the member for a very important uh, question. Speaker, ensuring the health and safe workplaces is the most important part of my job. We all have a role to play to ensure that our workplaces are healthy and are safe, and especially as the as as the youth of our province are starting to uh, find jobs, summer jobs, we need to make sure that they get those jobs uh, and they are able to perform them at safe workplaces. As I said, Speaker, it is a partnership. We all have to work together so that uh, we are keeping our workplaces safe for our youth. For example, parents, uh, uh, Speaker, for parents, they, uh, I ask them to please check that your daughter or son receives health and safety training for their uh, loved ones uh, at the job. My message to the youth is to be sure to inform your parents uh, and the employer Answer. if you get injured. Speaker, 2012 was the fifth consecutive year in a row that we conducted health and safety blitz for new and young workers. We'll continue with these blitz to ensure Thank that you. our workplace is safe for yeah, youth yeah. employed. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Supplementary. Minister, safety doesn't just happen. And new and young workers are often reluctant to seek help in staying safe on the job. Your ministry needs to focus on educating both workers and employers about their rights and responsibilities under the Employment Standards Act. Young workers are vulnerable. They may be taken advantage of if they're unaware of their rights in regards to such things as hours of work, required break times, minimum wage, overtime, termination and severance pay. Recently, the Ontario Court of Justice ruled on a case where the Ontario Ministry of Labour had charged an employer for failing to pay wages to its employees. Minister, what was the outcome of this Question. decision? Thank you. Labor. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. And, and protecting vulnerable workers like seasonal businesses, uh, in seasonal businesses or young workers is a very important uh, responsibility and, uh, and priority for the Ministry of Labour. In 2007 and 2008, the Ministry received employment standards claims from a substantial number of former employees who worked for a business known as All Pool Solutions and Aquatic Pool Solutions in Mississauga. Uh, most of those claimants, uh, Speaker, were actually students. Uh, the ministry uh, 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 issued three orders to, uh, uh, to the company to pay totaling $63,000, and other charges were laid as well. Uh, most recently, Speaker, the Ontario Court of Justice in Brampton sentenced the director of that company to 90 days in jail, imposed a fine of $15,000, and ordered the outstanding wages of about $55,000 to be paid. I think, Speaker, it clearly shows that the government and, of course, our court system is very serious in protecting vulnerable workers like our youth, and I encourage them uh, to you. report any incidents yeah, to yeah. the Ministry of Labour. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. New question, the member from Wellington, Halton Hills. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Just before Christmas, I emailed the Minister's office to inquire about the approval process for funding for Kaleidico, a new medication that shows great promise in the treatment of cystic fibrosis patients who have the G551D mutation. When the House resumed sitting on February the 20th, I spoke to the Minister personally, informing her of the issue and asking for her help. I spoke to her again on March 20th, and I raised it in the Legislature during debate on March 26th. We learned in late March that the Canadian Drug Expert Committee has recommended that Kaleidico be placed on the formulary and be publicly funded for the treatment of cystic fibrosis patients aged six and older who have this genetic mutation. What is the minister doing to ensure that cystic fibrosis patients in Ontario who could potentially recover their health have access to Kaleidico? Thank you. Minister of Health and Speaker, uh, thank you to the member opposite for this question, and I know many of us in this legislature advocate for patients who are looking for access to drugs that are not currently covered. I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, our drug budget is now $4.4 billion. That's a significant increase, an increase of uh, $1.4 billion since we took office. We're covering more drugs, uh, and we're covering drugs for more conditions. Speaker, I think the member opposite does understand that this is a process. I've explained it to him before. 
we have actually taken these decisions out of the hands of politicians and put these decisions into the hands of experts. Speaker. That is the right thing to do, and I look forward to updating the member on this particular draw. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I want to make it clear it was never my intention to politicize this issue. I first raised the minister, raised this with the minister last December, and it's now May. The need for funding for Kaleidico for CF patients was brought to my attention by a constituent, Shelley Phipps from Georgetown. Her 17-year-old daughter, Madison, has cystic fibrosis, and in her young life, she has spent more than 250 days in the hospital. I have met with a representative of Kaleidico's manufacturer, Vertex, and I've communicated with the CF Foundation. I've even met a, patient, a CF patient named Chris McLeod, who is a lawyer in Toronto and has gotten his life back because of Kaleidico. I want to do everything I can to help. Will the minister commit to this House that she will undertake to do all that she can to expedite the process, giving hope to CF patients across this province? Uh, speaker, I, I can assure you that I will do everything I can to ensure that the process is being followed in this case. Speaker. You know, we have a budget coming down this afternoon. One of the things that uh, we talk about in a budget is can we afford to spend more, Speaker, to care for more people? Our government is very clear. We are prepared to spend more to support more people Order. with their health care needs. It's disappointing when I hear from the member opposite, who's going to vote against the budget, even though, Speaker, they haven't even read it. Their plan is to cut spending. Our plan is to continue on a steady path to balance. Thank you. Your question? Member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this week Ontarians learned a the member from Halton. The member from Halton is warned. Ask your question, please. Thank you. Uh, speaker, this week Ontarians learned about the Telford family. This family has been living with unimaginable stress and an endless battle to get appropriate care for their 19-year-old son, who is developmentally disabled and has autism. They finally reached the breaking point this week and had to relinquish care of their son. My question is simple. Does the Premier think that this is appropriate, that the only way these families are able to secure the care and support for their children that they need? Thank you, Premier. Community and Social Services. The Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm certainly aware of the uh, media reports on this case. And as you know, I'm prohibited both uh, legally and in professional practice from commenting on the specifics of any case. But that said, I recognize, as I think all members of this uh, assembly do, that uh, an adult family member uh, with a developmental disability can be challenging for parents, particularly aging parents. And uh, we understand the concerns that are being raised. We've made, uh, we've made some real strides over the last few years. We've uh, increased funding some uh, 58%. Uh, we don't stop looking, uh, Mr. Speaker, for solutions at, uh, at any point. And uh, well, each situation is uh, is different. Our staff uh, in the ministry and uh, throughout Ontario are committed uh, to responding as best we can uh, to the needs of, uh, of, of uh, parents and uh, children in this situation. Supplementary. You know, Speaker, last fall the Arthurs family in Sarnia was in a very similar situation. For years, they worked tirelessly to provide the care their daughter needed, but when this family reached their breaking point, there was no services there for them. Only after leaving their daughter at the local community living and launching a very public campaign did this government find a workable solution. Speaker, it's shocking that in Ontario, families only receive appropriate care after giving up their children and going to the media. Does the Premier agree that no family should have to relinquish care in order to get appropriate services? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I uh, want to point out to the member opposite that it was our government that created the passport program and, and is investing $1.7 billion. I just want, uh, want, want you to. Order, please. 
I'm trying to give you a hand. Order, please. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate every break I can get in uh, in life. You know, it's uh, um, we uh, invest uh, on the residential side some 1.08 uh, uh, billions of dollars and uh, some 610 million dollars in supports. I would just point out, Mr. Mr. Speaker, that the third party. Uh, when they issued their list of demands for the upcoming budget, regrettably didn't say a single thing about support for those uh, requiring developmental services. Answer. The, Premier, the Premier has said uh, in, in an earlier response that uh, Thank you. you have every reason to look forward to the... Just to show you, um, I wasn't kidding. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. The member from Renfrew, uh, Nipissing Pembroke, is warned. And uh, I hope our performance this afternoon doesn't challenge me to the next phase of my words to you. The member for Essex, uh, 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 Middlesex, Algon Middlesex, London, has pointed something out to me that many of you have. Uh, and I would like to introduce in the speaker's gallery today, Mr. Steve Peters. Yeah. Yeah. Member in the 37th, 38th, 39th, and speaker in the 39th Parliament. I, I have a feeling that they want us to switch spaces. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, no, thank you? Okay. <laughs> There are no deferred votes this house stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.